Ciao, qui Gioffo Magalli, fondatore ed editore della casa editrice Ibex Edizioni. Il video che stai per vedere è la prima metà del famoso, della famosa lezione che Eric Schmidt, che è l'ex SEO di Google, ha tenuto all'Università di Stanford. Eh, ti consiglio di guardarlo tutto, ti consiglio di guardarlo tutto prima che lo elimino perché... Il rischio c'è, è già stato tirato giù da tutta una serie di altri, di altri canali. È la prima volta che questo video viene tradotto in italiano e Ibex, la redazione di Ibex si è presa la briga di effettuare questa, questa traduzione. Di cosa parla? Parla di intelligenza artificiale, non ti spaventare se all'inizio ci saranno dei termini un po' tecnici, vedrai che dopo un po' il discorso diventa molto più ampio e si apre su tematiche ehm, meno specifiche come ad esempio il ruolo dell'intelligenza artificiale nei conflitti e ehm, racconta delle cose, delle cose particolari, delle cose che secondo noi di Ibex il pubblico italiano eh, doveva avere anche tradotte, tradotte in italiano e che aiutano a capire un un po' meglio il contesto in cui ci muoviamo. L'intervista non è recentissima, nel senso che ha qualche mesetto di vita ormai, quindi vedrai fare riferimento a eh, maggio-giugno, perché l'intervista è, è stata girata prima. Però in realtà i contenuti sono comunque ipervalidi. Come al solito, le lenti di riferimento che ti consigliamo per vedere questo video e per interpretarlo al meglio sono della guerra del generale Karl von Clausewitz, che Ibex ha pubblicato con una prefazione del generale Mini e propaganda di Edward Bernet che è un po' il fondatore della scienza delle pubbliche relazioni e della costruzione del consenso per cui adesso ti lascio la prima parte della, di questa intervista di questa lezione fatta da Schmidt a Stanford e ti invito a seguire il canale per non perderti anche la seconda, la seconda metà quando la pubblicheremo ciao In the next year, you're going to see very large context windows, agents, and text to action. When they are delivered at scale, it's going to have an impact on the world at a scale that no one understands yet. Much bigger than the horrific impact we've had on, by social media, right, in my view. So here's why. In a context window, you can basically use that as short-term memory. And I was shocked that context windows get this long. The technical reasons have to do with the fact that it's hard to serve, hard to calculate, and so forth. The interesting thing about short-term memory is that when you feed, the, the ask it a question, read 20 books, you give it the text of the books is the query, and you say, tell me what they say, it forgets the middle, which is exactly how human brains work to, mm -hmm. right? That's where we are. With respect to agents, there are people who are now building essentially LLM agents And the way they do it is they read something like chemistry, they discover the principles of chemistry, and then they test it, and then they add that back into their <coughs> understanding, right? That's extremely powerful. And then the third thing, as I mentioned, is text action. So I'll give you an example. The government is in the process of trying to ban TikTok. We'll see if that actually happens. If TikTok is banned, here's what I propose each and every one of you do. Say to your LLM, The following. Make me a copy of TikTok, steal all the users, steal all the music, put my preferences in it, produce this program in the next 30 seconds, release it, and in one hour, if it's not viral, do something different along the same lines. That's the command. <laughs> Boom. You understand how powerful that is. If you can go from arbitrary language to arbitrary digital command, which is essentially what Python in this scenario is, Imagine that each and every human on the planet has their own programmer that actually does what they want, as opposed to the programmers that work for me who don't do what I ask, right? <laughs> the programmers here know what I'm talking about. So imagine a non-arrogant programmer that actually does what you want, and you don't have to pay all that money to. And there's infinite supply of these programmers. And this is all within the next year or two? Very soon. Those three things, and I'm quite convinced it's the union of those three things. It will happen in the next wave. So you asked about what else is going to happen. Um, every six months, I oscillate. So we're on a even odd oscillation. <laughs> so at the moment, the gap between the frontier models, of which there are yeah. now only three, I'll review who they are, and everybody else, appears to me to be getting larger. Six months ago, I was convinced that the gap was getting smaller. 
So I invested lots of money in the little companies. Now I'm not so sure. And I'm talking to the big companies, and the big companies are telling me that they need 10 billion, 20 billion, 50 billion, 100 billion. They're, Stargate is uh, what, 100 billion, right? They're very, very hard. I talked, Sam Alt is a close friend. He believes that it's going to take about 300 billion, maybe more. I pointed out to him that I'd done the calculation on the amount of energy required. And I, and I then, in the spirit of full disclosure, went to the White House on Friday and told them that we need to become best friends with Canada. Because <laughs> Canada has really nice people, helped invent AI, and lots of hydropower. Mm -hmm. Because we as a country do not have enough power to do this. The alternative is to have the Arabs fund it. And I like the Arabs personally. Uh, I spent lots of time there, right? But they're not going to adhere to our national security rules, whereas Canada and the U.S. are part of a triumvirate where we all agree. So these $100 billion, $300 billion data centers, electricity starts becoming the scary source. Well, yeah. well or, and, and by the way, if you follow the line of reasoning, why did I discuss CUDA and NVIDIA? If $300 billion is all going to go to NVIDIA, you know what to do in the stock market. <laughs> okay. That's not a stock recommendation. I'm not a licensed. <laughs> well, well, part of it, so we're going to need a lot more chips, but yeah. Intel is getting a lot of money from the U.S. government, ah. uh, AMD, and they're trying to build, you know, fabs and Ra Korea. Raise your hand if you have an Intel computer in your, <laughs> an Intel chip in any of your computing devices. Okay. So much for the okay. monopoly. Well, that, well that's, that's the point, though. They yeah. once did have, and NVIDIA has a monopoly now. So are those barriers to entry, like, like CUDA, so I was talking to Percy, Percy Lang the other day. He's switching between TPUs and NVIDIA chips depending on what he can get access to. For That's training because he doesn't have a choice. If he had infinite money, he would today he would pick the B200 architecture out of NVIDIA because mm -hmm. it would be faster. Mm -hmm. You were at Google for a long time, and uh, they invented the transformer architecture. But now it doesn't seem like they're... They, they've kind of lost the initiative to open AI, and even the last leaderboard I saw, Anthropics Cloud, was at the top of the list... I asked Sundar this. He didn't really give me a very sharp mm -hmm. answer. Maybe, maybe you have a, a, a sharper or a more objective uh, explanation for what's going on there. I'm no longer a Google employee. Yes. Um, in the spirit of full disclosure, um, Google decided that work-life balance and going home early and working from home was more important than winning. And the startups, the reason startups work is because the people work like hell. And I'm sorry to be so blunt. But the fact of the matter is if you all leave the university and go found a company, you're not going to let people work from home and only come in one day a week if you want to compete against the other startups. When, when, in the early days of Google, Microsoft was like that. Exactly. But now it seems to be... And there's, a, there's a long history of, in my industry, our industry, I guess, of companies winning in a way and really dominating a space and not making this, the next transition. It's very well documented. And I think that the truth is founders are special. The founders need to be in charge. The founders are difficult to work with. They push people hard. Um, as much as we can dislike Elon's personal behavior, look at what he gets out of people. Mm -hmm. uh, I had dinner with him, and he was flying. I was in Montana. He was flying that night at 10 p.m. to have a meeting at midnight with X.ai. Right. Think midnight. about it. I was in Taiwan. Different country, different culture. And they said that, uh, and this is TSMC, who I'm very impressed with, and they have a rule that the starting PhDs coming out of the, they're good, good physicists, work in the factory on the basement floor. Now, can you imagine getting American physicists to do that? The PhDs? Highly unlikely. Different work ethic. And the problem here, the, the reason I'm being so harsh about work is that these are systems which have network effects. So time matters a lot. And in most businesses, time doesn't matter that much, right? You have lots of time. You know, Coke and Pepsi will still be around, and the fight between Coke and Pepsi will continue to go on, and mm -hmm. it's all glacial, mm -hmm. right? When I dealt with telcos, the typical telco deal would take 18 months to sign, right? There's no reason to take 18 months to do anything. Get it done. It's just, it, it, we're in a period of maximum growth, maximum gain. So, and also it takes 
crazy ideas. Like when Microsoft did the OpenAI deal, I thought that was the stupidest idea I'd ever heard. Outsourcing essentially your AI leadership to OpenAI and Sam and his team. I mean, that's insane. Nobody would do that at Microsoft or anywhere else. And yet today, they're on their way to being the most valuable company. They're certainly head-to-head in Apple. Apple does not have a good AI solution. Mm -hmm. And it looks like they made it work. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. In terms of national security, we're going to play a role or competition with China as well. So I was the chairman of an AI commission that sort of looked at this very carefully. And um, you can read it. It's about 752 pages. And I'll just summarize it by saying, we're ahead. We need to stay ahead. And we need lots of money to do so. Our customers were the Senate and the House. Um, And out of that came the CHIPS Act and a lot of other stuff like that. The rough scenario is that if you assume the frontier models drive forward and a few of the open source models, it's likely that a very small number of companies can play this game. Countries, excuse me. What are those countries or who are they? Countries with a lot of money and a lot of talent, strong educational systems, and a willingness to win. The U.S. is one of them. China is another one. How many others are there? Are there any others? (laughs) I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. But certainly, the, 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 in your lifetimes, the battle between U, the U.S. and China for knowledge supremacy is going to be the big fight, right? So the U.S. government banned, uh, essentially, the NVIDIA chips, although they weren't allowed to say that was what they were doing, but they actually did that into China. Um, they have about a 10-year chip advantage. We have a, a roughly 10-year chip advantage in terms of sub-DUV, that is sub-5 nanometer 10 years, chip. that long? Roughly 10 years. Wow. Um, and so you're going to have, so an example would be today we're a couple of years ahead of China. My guess is we'll get a few more years ahead of China and the Chinese are whopping mad about this. It's like hugely upset about it. So that's a big deal. That was a decision made by the Trump administration and furthered by the Biden administration. Do you find that the administration today and in Congress is listening to your advice? Do you think that it, it's going to make that scale of investment? I mean, chips act, but beyond that? Building, so, in, building a massive AI system? So, so as you know, I, I lead a, an informal, ad hoc, non-legal group. That's, not, <laughs> that's different from illegal. Yes, exactly, just to be clear. Uh, which, includes all the usual, <laughs> which includes all the usual suspects. Yeah. Over the last year, came up with the basis of the reasoning that became the, um, the Biden administration's uh, AI Act which is the longest presidential directive in history. You're talking about the Special Competitive Studies Project? No, No. this is the actual actual act uh, from the executive office. And there are big details. Mm -hmm. So far, they've got it right. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, one of the debates that we had for the last year has been, how do you detect danger in a system which has learned it, but you don't know what to ask it? Okay, so in other words, it's it's a sort of a core problem. It's learned something bad, but it, it can't tell you what it learned, and you don't know what to ask it. And there's so many threats, right? Like it learned how to mix chemistry in some new way that you don't know how to ask it. And so people are working hard on that. But we ultimately wrote in our memos to them that there was a threshold which we arbitrarily named as 10 to the 26 flops, which technically is a measure of computation, that above that threshold you had to report to the government that you were doing this. I think all of these distinctions go away because the technology will now, the technical term is called federated training, where basically you can take pieces and and, and union them together. Mm -hmm. So we may not be able to keep keep people safe from these new things. Well, rumors are that's how OpenAI has had to train, partly because of the power uh, consumption. There's no one place where they did. Well, let's talk to about a real war that's going on. I know that uh, something you've been very involved in is... uh, the Ukraine war, and in particular, uh, I don't know how much you can talk about White Stork and, and your your goal of having uh, five hundred thousand five hundred dollar drones, yeah. five million dollar tanks. So, so how's that changing warfare? So I worked for the Secretary of for seven years, and tr- and tried to change the way we run our military. I'm not a particularly big fan of the military, but it's very expensive, and I wanted to see if I could be helpful. And I think, in my view, I largely failed. They gave me a medal. So they must give medals to failure or, <laughs> you know, whatever. But my self-criticism was nothing has really changed. And the system in America is not going to lead to real innovation. So watching the Russians 
use tanks to destroy apartment buildings with little old ladies and kids just drove me crazy. So I decided to work on a company with your friend Sebastian Thrun, and a number, as a former faculty member here, and a whole bunch of Stanford people. And the idea basically is to do two things. Use AI in complicated, powerful ways for these essentially robotic war. And the second one is to lower the cost of the robots. Now you sit there and you go, why would a good liberal like me do that? And the answer is that the whole theory of armies is tanks, artilleries, and mortar, and we can eliminate all of them. And we can make the penalty for invading a country, at least by land, essentially be impossible. It should eliminate the kind of land battles. Well, this, this is a really interesting question, is that does it give more advantage to defense versus offense? Can you even so make I, that distinction? Because I've been doing it last year, I've learned a lot about war that I really did not want to know. And one of the things to know about war is that the offense always has the advantage because you can always overwhelm the defensive systems. And so you're better off as a strategy of national defense to have a very strong offense that you can use if you need to. And the systems that I and others are building will do that. Um, because of the way the system works, I am now a licensed arms dealer. A, so a computer scientist, businessman, <laughs> arms dealer. And, um, and I'm sorry Is to say. Is that a progression? <laughs> I, do, I don't know. I do not recommend this in your career path. I'd stick with AI. Um, and because of the way the laws work, um, we're doing this privately, and then it's, this is all legal with the support of the governments. It goes straight into the Ukraine, and then they fight the war. And, and, and without going into all the details, things are pretty bad. I think if in May or June, if the Russians uh, build up as they are expecting to, Ukraine will lose a whole chunk of its territory and will begin the process of losing the whole country. So the situation is quite dire. And if anyone knows Marjorie Taylor Greene, I would encourage you to delete her from your contact list because she's the one, a single individual is blocking the provision of some number of billions of dollars to save a, an important democracy.